here Mil Minuro Ode and Harvey Tenenbaum, although most of his papers were from his days with Ricardo, uh, but, Ricard uh, but Harvey was uh, a graduate student here uh, at MIT. Fifty years ago was the birthday of X-ray astronomy. And ten years ago, Ricardo Giacconi received the Nobel Prize for physics. And it was cited, we can read that together, the pioneering contributions to astrophysics which have led to the discovery of X-ray sources. There is no question that Ricardo deserved the Nobel Prize. But in my opinion, it would have been so nice and appropriate if already 25 years ago, the Nobel Prize had been awarded to Ricardo, to Bruno Rossi, and to Herb Friedman. Bruno died in 1993, Herb Friedman died in 2000. Clearly, the Nobel Committee was too slow. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for sharing this uh, pers personal history of the development of a subject of physics on this very fitting day, uh, the day in which the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded. And to see the contributions made by so many here at, at MIT and in the area, AS&E uh, and Harvard-Smithsonian, uh, really is a testament to what we're celebrating today in the astronomical event, that is, the importance that one institution and a group of dedicated scientists can make to the establishment of a new field. So with that, I open the, uh, to open, uh, the floor to questions from the audience. I'm uh, sure there will be some, and I invite George, you to, George to come here. to the microphones. And, and George, George, George Clark, Clark in, in, indeed is here, uh, the hero of uh, much of this work uh, beneath it. People are dumbfounded. <laughs> okay. Bernie, I knew you would be the first. <laughs> it, it fits your personality. A little louder if you can, because I have a hearing disability. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we both have one, that's right. <laughs> I can hear myself talk. Uh, but uh, one should note that uh, a great deal of the work was, a great deal of the work was uh, uh, foreshadowed by discoveries in radio astronomy. I can't follow your argument. Maybe without the microphone, it may be better. You radio astronomers had our role to play, mostly because we both dealt with high energy phenomena. And, uh, in particular, the Crab Nebula, which is one of the most dramatic, uh, was a radio discovery. And the detection of the pulsar at the center of the Crab Nebula was also a radio discovery. I see both. No. No, the pulsar was Dave Stalin, but the period was determined in Arecibo. That, that's correct. Dave Stalin and... But Dave Stalin uh, found it, yeah. But Arecibo, again, they... Shorten the integration time. And well, they knew that was a pulsar, and so they got the theory. Yeah. So, what is your point now? I miss it. <laughs> I don't have any comment. Oh, well. Requires Thank you for the comment. <laughs> <laughs> I did want David Salem to get a little bit of credit. 
I gave Dave enough credit, I hope. He mentioned it, but he didn't mention that it was radio. <laughs> yeah. okay. Pulsar. Yeah. There were only the, there were only oh. there were only radio pulsars in those days. Sixty-seven, the Cambridge Group discovered three pulsars. They first thought actually it was intelligent life somewhere else, and they called them little green men. You know that story. <laughs> And then finally they realized it wasn't, it wasn't the uh, little green man's. When they published it, they did not realize that what they were looking at was rotating neutron stars. It was Tommy Gold from Cornell who immediately said, there's got to be neutron stars rotating because of the incredible accuracy in the period. It was, it was Zwicky. It was Zwicky and Bade who in 1934, only two years after the discovery of a neutron, casually suggested maybe neutron stars exist and maybe they are formed in supernovae. Amazing what an insight. So Stalin, who knew that, immediately looked at the Grad Nebula to confirm Zwicky and Bade. And he found the pulsar. But he didn't have the sensitivity to get the period right. And so when Arecibo heard that, they found the 33 milliseconds. I just made a comment, it's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can see that we're going to have a lot more history to, to recount, <laughs> but let's, let's uh, have some more questions from the audience. Uh, Neil. Uh, Walter, you launched numerous balloons. What was your batting average in terms of ones that were successful and ones that you lost? Um, I would say, over the years, the beginning, George and I did. The, George, was, George actually deserves the credit for having been the first person in 1964, I was not at MIT, to fly a balloon and discovered high energy X rays from the Crab Nebula. And what is even interesting historically, which you can read about in my book, uh, For the Love of Physics, originally he wanted to look during the day at COX 1. The moment that he heard that Friedman had identified the Crab Nebula, he changed his plans and he went for a night flight and discovered X-rays from Crab. When I joined George's group, I got involved in the ballooning. Well, and I, uh, George was very generous to me. At one point he said, why don't you take the group? Um, I would say the total number of balloons that I have flown is probably 2025, and the success rate was probably not much higher than 60 or 70 percent. However, our instruments always worked, and that's largely due to George Wicker. And our competition, who also had a record on balloon failures, they also had about 70 percent percent success of the balloons. They didn't even have 50% success on their instruments because their batteries froze up. Uh, all kinds of nasty things. So it, at least every time that we made it to altitude, we went up to 145,000 feet. 145,000 feet. Airplanes fly at 30,000 feet. Our instruments always worked. George was there when GX1 plus 4 was discovered. Walter, what you don't know is I taught George physics. <laughs> uh, after you watch my lectures on the web. No, <laughs> He's in my fraternity. I was a junior when he was a freshman. And he needed help. <laughs> oh. So you deserve credit for GX1 plus 4. <laughs> And a lot more. <laughs> Walter, I have, a, I have a question about the role of theoreticians. Several times in your talk, the word black hole rolled off the tip of your tongue as if it was the most natural thing in the world. But there were a few skeptics at that time, and, and maybe even still are, about the existence of these creatures in space. When did you become convinced that some of these cosmic X-ray sources were, in fact, black holes? All right. For this talk, I was only allowed 60 minutes. 
and therefore there's certain things that you have to leave out. Before the discovery that Cygnus X1 was very likely a black hole, it was already generally accepted that the extragalactic sources, the very bright radio and X-ray sources, that they were already supermassive black holes. M87 has a black hole of the order of one billion solar masses. That was already pretty much accepted. The discovery of the black hole in Cygnus X1 was the first stellar mass black hole. We now know very accurately what the mass is, largely due to one of my former graduate students, Jeffrey McClintock, who, strangely enough, is not here. We now know that the black hole is 15 solar masses. Now coming back to your question. When did I really believe that it was a black hole? Yeah, that's a slow process, you see. When, when the pulsations were seen from maybe, all... Maybe you don't believe it now. Oh, there's no <laughs> doubt in my mind. I, I'll bet you a, a year's salary. Your salary against my salary. <laughs> Absolutely. Didn't I give you a raise recently? <laughs> no, there's no doubt. See, the interesting thing is that uh, the method that was introduced by Webster and Merdin and by Bolton that you can get the lower limit of the accretor has been done now dozens of times on many transient sources. And every time that you find that the mass is more than three solar masses, no pulsations. And every time that you find that the mass is below three solar masses, pulsations. Why do you think that is? Because black holes cannot pulse because they have no surface. So it's obvious. For me, it's not even an issue. I doubt whether there's any astronomer in the audience, any prominent astronomer, I should say. <laughs> I doubt whether there's anyone who doesn't believe that the many of the X-ray binaries are, the, the transients particularly, have a black hole as an accretor. If you have the courage to stand up, do it! <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yes. Have I convinced you? You have. <laughs> um, yes. Do you have any preference for one form of observation or wavelength span, X-rays, optical, radio, for studying these sources? Absolutely not. Anything that would add to our knowledge, so much the better. No, in fact, a major discovery, which, uh, again, I have only 60 minutes today, the whole story about when I casually said the most likely optical identification of Cygnus X1. I could t tell you 10 minutes how that came about. That's a beautiful story. Many groups with rockets tried to pinpoint that source. And the error boxes became smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But they were always too large to be lucky and find an optical counterpart. And then one day, that was, it was, that was actually on the uh, APJ letters that I showed you, <laughs> then one day, Yelming discovered radio emission from a source in the general direction of Cygnus X1. And that was extremely unusual. Since he then suggested, well, there's got to be Cygnus X1, the error box, all of a sudden, because of the accuracy of the radio positions, all of a sudden became four arc seconds. And in those four arc second box was a B0 supergiant. That was obviously the optical counterpart. And so then, what Webster and Merlin and Bolton looked at that B0 supergiant. What is even more interesting, which I had to leave out because I only had 60 minutes, <laughs> the great astronomer, Alan Sandwich, looked at that star and published and said, this is an ordinary B0 supergiant. There's nothing special about it. This is not Cygnus X1. The great Alan Sandwich. But the other guys looked a little longer and they found that it was a binary. So even something as you know, casually saying 
the most likely optical identification. There's a, a whole history behind that. And it was only because of the radio detections that the error box from this big all of a sudden became this small. Thank you. I Sorry think when I get a little bit emotional, but it's part of my nature. <laughs> We've, we've learned a few lessons from this talk. One is that it pays to make careful measurements. Of course, you help, by, help yourself by coming up to bat multiple times so that you have the chances to make those measurements succeed. And finally, I think there's no better company to share the discovery and the excitement of physics and astrophysics than with Professor Walter Lewin. And I'd like to invite the audience now to come to a reception down in lobby 10, one floor below us to have the chance to uh, speak with Professor Lewin and with each other. Thank you very much for coming to this colloquium. <laughs> Thank you.